The question is, well, how do we know if faith is real if there's no works? Doesn't the Bible say faith without works is dead? And so don't we have to do works to be saved? Isn't that the argument? Is that what we have to be doing? But there's two understandings of that, and one's biblical, one's not. So the Roman Catholic view of salvation, and really any works-based system of salvation, takes works and puts it at the root and says that works plus your faith in Jesus is what produces salvation. But the Bible teaches that it's not the root, it's actually the fruit, that your faith alone in Jesus, that is what saves. And then a, a life that has been saved, a sanctified, regenerated heart produces fruit the fruit of good works. And so you know a person's been saved because of their fruit, but the fruit is not the reason they're saved. They're saved by God, by grace, through faith in Christ. So the Bible reading tonight is from James chapter two, verses 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. This is God's word. James is the most practical of all the books in the Bible. It really is one of the most straightforward books, but you'd be surprised to learn that even in James, commentators dispute certain things, um, nothing necessary that is critical to the understanding of the text, but there are a few disputed things in this particular passage, which we're not going to go through. Um, I don't think they're important, but this is very, very simple to understand, so I'm going to just try and help you solidify what James is saying and hopefully it'll be helpful to you and the Lord will challenge you. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you again that we can spend some time just going through your word. Uh, it is all we have to know how we are supposed to live. It is a revelation of yourself and you have given us insight into how you expect us to respond to who you are. It is a revelation of yourself so that in the Lord Jesus Christ, we see the Father, we see you. And so we pray this evening again that we would see something of what it means to be a Christian and that you would help us to not just simply hear your word, but to be doers as the text tells us tonight. For Jesus' sake, amen. Mix my pages up. In 1893, a long, long time ago, George Ferris built a machine that bears his name, the Ferris wheel. I'm sure some of you have been on the Ferris wheel. When it was finished, he invited a newspaper reporter to accompany him and his wife 
for the inaugural ride. You know, the Ferris wheel, the big round thing, right? It was a windy day in July, so a stiff breeze struck the wheel with great force as it slowly began its rotation. Despite the wind, the wheel turned flawlessly. After one revolution, Ferris called for the machine to be stopped so that his wife and the reporter could step out. In braving that one revolution on the wind-blowing Ferris wheel, each occupant demonstrated genuine faith. Mr. Ferris began with the scientific knowledge that the machine would work and be safe. However, in order for that to be played out, the only way it could be proved was when someone sat in that machine and went round for the first time. That is experiential faith. And that fundamentally is what James is on about tonight. He wants us to understand there are two kinds of faith that can be expressed. One is a real faith, a living faith, and the other one is a dead faith. And so what we have to wrestle with this evening as we consider this passage is which one fits us, which one describes us. If we were to leave here this evening what would be evident in our lives, not so much to the people who are gathered here, but to the people out there. How would they describe our Christianity? Firstly, I want you to notice the description of dead faith. Verses 14 to 19. We'll trail through this bit by bit. Verses 14 to 19. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deed? So let's just pause there for the moment. James sets up a hypothetical situation, and we need to understand that this is where some of the argument comes with some of the commentators. It's a hypothetical situation because he's dealing with some issues in this congregation that he's writing to. Now remember, the context of the book is that he is writing primarily to Jewish Christians, which is why later on in the book he raises Abraham, and he raises the issue of Rahab. Though Rahab is a Gentile, so he's also covering some smattering of Gentile readers. But his first question is, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? So when he talks about my brothers, he's talking about the Christian church. This is not dealing with those outside of the church. And if you claim to have faith, he says, but have no deeds, the question is, Can that faith possibly save? He anticipates that some in the community are arguing all you need to do is have an orthodox belief system. What I mean by that is you need to understand the fundamentals of the faith. You need to understand that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Jesus Christ lived in this world. Jesus Christ was perfect. Jesus Christ died on a cross. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. Jesus Christ is coming back. If you could tick all the boxes, is that enough for faith? And he uh, says here that There are those in the congregation who are claiming that is sufficient for you to believe and sufficient for you to be saved. The hypothetical situation thus he sets up is those who perpetually, consistently are not engaged in any kind of activity that would be consistent with their faith. Are they saved? And the point that he wants to make initially is that those who claim orthodox belief but show no evidence of what they believe by the works or the deeds that they do, and he uses the word carefully in the original language, it literally means deeds, and the deeds that he speaks about are not works of the law, even though he's writing to a Jewish audience. So this is not about living in obedience to the law or fulfilling the demands of the law, but rather the deeds that he speaks about is those things that emanate or come out of an orthodox belief of Jesus. In other words, the righteous acts that believers are engaged in doing. Am I engaged 
in serving Christ in some way as an expression of my faith, or am I not? It is inconceivable for James to begin to even for a moment imagine that someone can claim to be a Christian and yet exhibit no deeds in their lives. Now, this has very, very significant implications. He makes it clear that the expression of such a faith is dead. Now, I've come across people who say, well, I came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I prayed a prayer, and that kind of got me into the kingdom of God, but I never ever go to church. I don't have to go to church because I believe in God and I'm a Christian. And James would say emphatically to someone like that, no, you are not. Because by definition, faith reveals itself in works, in deeds. Now, what he is not saying, and we need to really understand this very clearly, because this is why Martin Luther, that great reformer, did not accept this book as part of the canon of Scripture. So Martin Luther, who was converted as a monk and came to faith, or as a a priest in the the Catholic system, came to faith in Christ through reading Romans, took the book of James and he threw it out of his Bible. Because James thought that what, uh, rather Martin thought that what James was teaching is that you are saved by works. And James is not pitting faith against works. James is not saying in any sense that because a person is engaged in deeds, that that justifies them before God, because that is equally problematic as the person who claims to have faith but have no work. So in other words, there are those who seek to live a good life before God, who seek to live in obedience to the moral law of God who don't necessarily don the the doors of a church, who don't come through the doors of a church, who live out there and think that somehow because they are living righteously, in inverted commas, that that is enough to justify them before God so that when God on Judgment Day evaluates them, they will say, yes, but but my, my good works is what enables me to one day come into heaven. And James is not saying That So don't misunderstand what he's saying. He is using the present tense here when he says, um, in verse 16, if one of you says to him, go, uh, sorry, let me go back, can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister without clothes and daily food, if one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action, is dead. And then he's going to set up another example. And so James is saying, here's a situation. I want you to think very practically here. Someone comes into the church. They don't have a lot of money. They have great needs financially. They don't have money to buy food. And they come and express that. And in this situation, the person is dressed in a poor way. They literally, the word that he uses, naked. And they don't come in naked, but they're coming in rags, obvious that they are poor, and they ask for some help, and the Christians say, brother, I'll pray for you. And James says, that's not good enough. Because if you don't help him in the material needs that he or she has, then the faith that you are claiming to have is spurious, it's false. Now what happens? So, now there's an interlocutor. Now there's an objection. So someone stands up and is hypothetical again and makes this objection. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. So the objection is this. Well, okay, you claiming that you've got faith or I, I, I'll claim that I've got faith and, and you claim you've got deeds, well, Aren't, aren't, aren't that the same thing? Isn't that the same thing? I mean, I just have deed you have faith. I mean, what's the difference between you and me? Yours is expressed by means of an orthodox belief. Mine is expressed by what I do. Isn't both of those things equally true? Doesn't works along with faith both justify you before God? That's the problem that he deals with. Now look what he says. Show me your faith, verse 18, without deeds, 
and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there's one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Now, that's remarkable. Have you encountered people in your life who, when you talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, would affirm that they believe in God and that that is sufficient for them to get into heaven? Now, James says the demons believe in God. Do you remember what happens when uh, the, <coughs> some of the disciples are casting out demons and then you get some people who follow them around and try and also cast out demons in the book of Acts and it backfires? And these men who are trying to cast out demons get beaten up by the men who have the demons in them and the demons address these men and they say, Paul, I know, and Peter, I know, but who are you? So that the reality of the fact is that demons have, in inverted commas, faith. They believe in God. They know God exists. But the question you have to ask, are, are any demons going to be in heaven? And the emphatic answer is no. They are not going to be in heaven, despite what they believe about God. So if someone simply expresses belief in God, James argues that is not enough. Faith must evidence itself in works. All of the Jews, in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, if I can read that um, for you, if you return to Deuteronomy, is a Shema. All the Jews could recite that out, and they would recite that religiously, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Uh, verse 6 reads as follows. Well, we go take it up from verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit down at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. That first part, verse 4, everyone could recite. That was the Shema. And you could recite that, and that was considered to be orthodox faith. And James says that's not enough. That's not enough. Unless your faith is consistently being worked out, it is a false faith. Let me try and illustrate this, and sorry, Michael, I'm going to embarrass him now. I haven't told him I'm going to share this. When he was much, much younger, and I can't remember if it was around about five or six, but it was somewhere between the ages of five and seven. He used to come with me when I played golf on the golf course because he was good at finding my lost balls. And so I'd hit them in the rough, and he would go and look for them and find them. <laughs> we were on one of the golf courses, yeah, but now you hit in the rough too. Uh, uh, we were on one of these golf courses, and I was, we were in golf carts, and we were driving around, which made the whole process easier. And as we got to the 11th hole, one of the cart's batteries died. So the guys I were with said to me, Ian, do you want to drive back with Michael and bring back another cart? So I looked at Michael, and he's always, he was always tall for his age, right? So if you ever have children and they're tall for their age, don't treat them as more mature than what they are, because they may look more mature than, they are, than what they are, but they're not. And so I turned to him and I said, Michael, do you think you can drive one of these? You know, you just push the accelerator. Right? Yeah, 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 I can do it, I can do it. Yeah, yeah. So we drove back to the clubhouse, which wasn't that far away. And being tall, he could reach the pedals. So it wasn't a problem in terms of height-wise. And, you know, he had a little motorbike at home that he could drive around, so he knew how to steer. I mean, that, that's pretty basic, right? So we put him in, I put him in the cart, and he sat down, and he reached the pedals. I said, okay, you push that one down, and then this is the brake, and, and we'll head off back. Well, it wasn't long before it crashed into something. So I, st I stopped and I said, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can do it, I can do it. So we started off again and he crashed again. And it became obvious that what he thought he could do and what he could actually do 
were two different things altogether. So he might have had faith that he could drive a golf cart, but the expression of that proved that he couldn't, and he had a defective belief. It's the same for your Christianity. You may believe you're a Christian. You may be able to articulate all the doctrines. You may be able to express what you believe about the Bible. You may be able to quote verses off by heart. But unless you are practicing your faith, you have a defective faith. I could have titled this message, Christianity, No Spectator Sport. We don't sit on the sidelines as Christians and claim to be followers of Christ without that faith being worked out consistently on a daily basis. Now, what that means is that it's not only worked out in terms of the way in which we live, but it's worked out in terms of the acts of service which we render to God according to the gifts that He has given us. Which means, effectively speaking, it's on one level impossible to come to church and be a pew warmer. Because faith expresses itself in deeds. You can't just sit here and never engage in service if you're a Christian, as we are going to see. So that is the description of dead faith, the description of living faith, verses 20 to 26. Listen to what James now says. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous by what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Now, that's badly translated. Uh, literally, in the original language, it says, Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he was about to do when he was about to offer his son Isaac on the altar? So, so that... It is, it is Abraham expressing his faith by what he did. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Now, what James is not saying is that the action of what Abraham did in putting Isaac on the altar justified him before God. He's not saying that. So don't misunderstand the example that he uses. Now, I'm assuming, and maybe I shouldn't, all of you know the story. We are told in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, that Abraham believed God, and that was considered righteousness. In other words, his faith is way back in Genesis 15. Now we get to Genesis 22. There's a whole heap of years that have been between Genesis 15 and Genesis 22. Now the promise to Abraham was that he would have a son. At 99, he has a son. God then tells him after a number of years to go and take that son and put that son on the altar. Now you can imagine what's going through the mind of Abraham. This is the child of the promise. This is the child he's been waiting for. Now God is saying to him, Abraham, put him on the altar and sacrifice him. Don't stand at arm's length. Put yourself in the place of being a parent. Or if you're not a parent, put yourself in the place of being a child. Imagine that your father took you and to a sacrifice place and he tied you up and he was about to light the flame and burn you so that you would be offered as a sacrifice before God. Now, from the account that we get, Abraham was probably a teenager. Uh, his son was probably, Isaac was probably a teenager. So there's a point at which Isaac could have probably resisted uh, uh, Abraham. And so there's a willingness on both parts to go through with what God has said. And we are told in Hebrews that, that Abraham believed that God, if necessary, could raise him from the dead. 
And so what James is trying to say to us is Abraham's faith expressed back in Genesis 15 is now made complete, is now proved by the willingness to put Isaac on the sacrifice. He showed that it wasn't just a belief that was in the head. His faith, in other words, was put beyond all doubt. There was no mistaking that Abraham's faith was genuine by the act of the willingness to offer his son. Abraham's action was not the cause of his faith. It was not the grounds of his faith, but the evidence and the proof of true faith. And then he gives another example. And the scripture was fulfilled. The scripture was fulfilled in the sense that his faith or the reality of his faith was proved and um, he was uh, shown to be a man of true faith. Now, look what he does with Rahab. Now he takes another example. Now, you know the story of Rahab. The spies are sent out to the land. They uh, go to spy out um, the land, and while they are in the land of Canaan, they find lodging with Rahab, who is a prostitute. Isn't it interesting how God chooses the most unlikely of people? And she expresses her belief in God, and that belief then is expressed not simply by the articulation of words, but by the willingness to hide the spies so that they can spend the night there and then leave in the morning undetected from the people of the, in the land of Canaan. And James says that that was an expression that her articulation of believing in God was not just saying something in order to be spared at some later time, but that was a genuine faith declaration evidenced by what she does. And so it was a true indication of faith. And the point that James is making is that if you are going to be a Christian who can be sure of your salvation and know that one day when you stand before God, He will enter and allow you to enter into His heaven, then faith, your faith is being continually expressed. Because the verb that James uses about faith being expressed in deeds is in the present tense, which designates ongoing action. Paul in Philippians 2 verse 12 says, work out your salvation. Jesus in Matthew 25, when he is separating the sheep from the goats, remember how Jesus does that. He says to the one said, whatever you did, you did to the least of these, you did to me. And the surprise of them is saying, well, what did we do? And Jesus says, well, whenever you ministered to another fellow believer, you were showing true faith. And so that the criteria by which their faith is evaluated is not the fact that they believe, though that is necessary, but rather the fact that they did works. And so it becomes absolutely critical that if we want to be considered our uh, absolutely sure about our salvation, it will be expressed by works. And so the question you have to wrestle with this evening is what does your faith look like? You know, when, when I stand up as a pastor in a church and say we've got gaps in ministry, and when I look at the amount of people that come to the church, we should have no gaps. We should have no gaps. Because if every Christian in this church was engaged in serving God and expressing their faith by their service in some area of ministry according to the gifts that God has given them, we would have no gaps. We wouldn't. Every area of ministry would in fact not only be functioning, but there would be people saying, Enough, we've got enough people. Find some other ministry to serve in. We're overflowing with people. Too many. Go somewhere else. And we wouldn't have to make appeals from the front saying we need playgroup helpers. We need rocks helpers, little rocks helpers. We need helpers in serving morning tea. We need helpers in cleaning the... We, 
we would be saying, we, we've got enough. Which then raises a very, very interesting question, doesn't it? Perhaps one that you and I might feel a little bit uncomfortable with. Is it possible? Is it possible that we have within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ those who claim to be saved, but through their lack of deeds are exposing the true nature of what their faith is or isn't? And that's more difficult to have to wrestle through. So what kind of faith do you have? Are you engaged actively in God's service? Many of you sitting here tonight are. In fact, some of you are too engaged. Some of you are engaged in a whole heap of areas precisely because we have gaps. And so you've put your hand up and you've said, yes, I'll serve here. Yes, I'll serve there. Yes, I'll serve there. And you're engaged in a whole lot of activities. And I wish I could take some of those off you. But in order for that to happen, every person who claims to be saved will engage in some area of service within this church. And that will be without exception. Now I understand when people get to a certain age and it starts becoming more difficult for them to be engaged in service, after all, we're not going to ask an 85-year-old to go to Little Rocks and run, run around with little children, lest they have a heart attack or fall and break a leg or whatever might happen, break a hip. I understand all of that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about those who are able to serve. Those people have done their service. They've got Money in the bank. But we're talking about others who, James says, have you really got faith? Really? Well, let's see it by what you are doing. Let's see it by your, need, your deeds. I want to close with a story that might put all of this together. Nice short sermon tonight. Yes, don't expect it all the time. Um. This is Ralph Neighbor who writes, Jack had been president of a large corporation, and when he got cancer, they ruthlessly dumped him. He went through his insurance, used his life savings, and had practically nothing left. I visited him one day with one of my deacons who said, Jack, you speak so openly about the brief life you have left. I wonder if you're prepared for your life after death. Dak stood up livid with rage. You Christians, all you ever think about is what is going to happen to me after I die. If your God is so great, why doesn't he do something about the real problems in my life? He went on to tell us that he was leaving his wife penniless and his daughter without money for college. Then he ordered us out. Later, my deacon insisted we go back. We did. Jack, I know I offended you, he said humbly. I humbly apologize. But I want you to know, I've been working since then. Your first problem is where your family will live after you die. A realtor in our church has agreed to sell your house and give your wife his commission. I guarantee you that, if you'll permit us, some of the other men and I will make the house payments until it's sold. Then I've contacted the owner of an apartment house down the street. He offered your wife a three-bedroom apartment plus free utilities and an $850 a month salary in return for her collecting rents and supervising plumbing and electrical repairs. The income from your house should pay for your daughter's college. I just want you to know your family will be well cared for. Jack cried like a baby. He died shortly thereafter. So wrapped in pain, he never accepted Christ. But he experienced God's love even while rejecting him. And his widow, touched by the caring Christians, came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith without works is dead. 
And we cannot as Christians in any sense claim to be saved if there's zero evidence of our faith being consistently, consistently worked out for as long as God gives us strength. And while you have strength, can I say this to you? If there's one thing I'm so deeply grateful to God about is that he saved me when I was young and has enabled me to serve him for almost 40 years so far. I don't know how much longer is left. But I'm so grateful for the length of time that God has given me to serve him. Could have I done more? Absolutely. Are there things I wish I'd be more proactive in? Yes, absolutely. But I'm glad that I have been at least engaged in some form of service. It costs time. It costs resources. It costs giving up certain things. It may be that you're going to sacrifice some recreational time. It may be that rather than relaxing and doing something you want to do, you're going to be doing something that God calls you and equips you to do. But you're going to gain great blessing from that. You're going to gain great contentment from that. And coupled to all of that, it's going to confirm the reality that you really are saved. Because it's not enough to claim salvation and not be engaged in serving Christ in some way and also engaged in living in a way that demonstrates true faith. And so he ends in verse 26. Listen to what he says. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. What kind of faith do you have? You and the Lord know. Is it genuine? Is it living? Or is it dead? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word this evening. It cuts to the heart, doesn't it, Lord? You confront us with the reality of what it means to be a Christian. We know that it's easy to articulate certain things. It's easy to claim certain things. But it's tr through the expression of what we claim to be that the reality of, or non-reality of our faith is demonstrated. So for all those here who know you and who are genuinely saved, I pray that while you give them breath in this world, that you would raise them up and cause them to be spent for the glory of God so that one day whenever their eyes close in death, they will be able to look back over a life that is faithfully engaged in serving you as an expression of their faith. Not because they think those works are going to justify them, but because this is simply a way of showing how much they love you by serving you diligently, faithfully, continually. And for those perhaps who are lacking in this area, Lord, you know who they are. They know who they are. Won't you confront them with this reality? And if they truly do believe in you, I pray that you would enable them to start putting into practice that which they claim to be. And if their faith is not genuine, if it is a dead faith, then I pray that you would enable them to become a living faith, that you would cause Christ to become real so that the expression of what they claim to believe is evidenced by all, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand as we...